Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise and glory for the gift of the Holy Spirit as we celebrate today on Pentecost. What a wondrous gift it is that you have brought the Jesus stuff to us with the gift of your Holy Spirit all the way here in 2021, just the same way that you brought it to your disciples when you established your church. Help us, by the aid of your Holy Spirit, to remain cognizant of our sinfulness and the gift and wonder of the gospel in Jesus, and embolden us to share that wondrous news with all of those you place in our path. Be with us today as we continue to study the creed and the scriptures that support it, so that we may better understand our own confession of faith. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, open up your small catechisms to page 177 for we're starting today. And if you don't have one, don't worry, I'll be repeating all the stuff that's going to be in the book. Okay, so we're, we, we went through part one of the, the creed, which was about uh, God the Father, and it was about creation. Now we're finishing up Article 2, and Article 2 is about God the Son and his work of redemption. Right. So the big paragraph is the second article of the creed, is what we'll call it. And we're basically chronicling... A confession of statement, a statement of faith about all of the things that Jesus did in order to work our redemption. Okay. Now I want to point out again, I think I brought this up at the very beginning when we started with the creeds, that one of the cool things about our creed is how specific it is. Okay. We're not just making a general statement about God. We have very specific things about him which he's revealed to us that we confess as true. Right. So we talked about a little bit about natural law, I think maybe last week, a little bit the week before. And we decided natural law that, you know, the creation proclaims the glory of its creator, but that only gets us so far. We would never understand Jesus just by observing nature. Right? And we had to get that information from God himself. And because we have, according to his word, we make this confession of faith. Right? And do you guys remember where this creed comes from? This is kind of set set the stage for our discussion here. Was it was it written verbatim in scripture? No, it wasn't. So did somebody just make it up? Council of Nicaea. Ah, yeah, one of the church early church councils, right? And if you think that that people split hairs nowadays, one of those councils was over the difference of one letter and one word. Right? And a lot of those early church controversies were centered on the subject of this article of the creed, which is the person of Jesus. Because he's the most radical claim there is, right? True God and true man all at the same time dies, really dies, condemned for our sins, and rises victorious over death. Right? Those are all radical claims. They just don't seem radical to us because we've heard them a bunch of times. But in the early church, that was always the subject of controversy among theologians, is how exactly this Jesus guy fits. And we talked about that last time, that he had to be true God and true man. So can somebody give us a little summary from last week? Why did Jesus have to be true God in order to accomplish God's plan of salvation? Live out the law perfectly, right? What else? Because the sins that are being forgiven are sins against him. Yeah, right? So because the sins that are being forgiven, they're being forgiven because they're transgressions against God. So he's the only one that can forgive those things. What about uh, his true man? Why was it necessary that he be true man in order to accomplish God's plan of salvation? Pete? So he could obey the law completely and fulfill every Right, so he could be a perfect man, a creature, a human creature, so he could per perfectly fulfill the law. Kinsman redeemer. Do what? Kinsman redeemer. Yep. And, and we talked about how once Jesus is born and dies for us, right, we become Jesus' siblings, essentially, right? Co-inheritors as sons of God, right? Even the women. We talked about that, if you remember, right? That technically, theologically speaking, we're all sons of God, men and women alike, because the purpose of that phrase was the inheritors. We all inherit the kingdom of God. 
There's one other key component that had to be a man. Why he had to be a man? He had to die. Yeah. He had to die, right? So the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, there's a reason that that's sort of the, the crux of the Christian faith. You know, Paul says that if that is not true, we are a people most to be pitied, because essentially we believe a lie, right? And it's also the most radical event that we claim. Because we're claiming that God, born under the law, became a man 100% and he died. It's a crazy claim to make. Right? Um, and then that he rose from the dead. Um, so if you've read a lot of books for people who are doubters of the Christian faith that do a serious inquiry into it, it's usually something pertaining to the resurrection. If they come to faith, that convinces them of that. Right, because Jesus doesn't just appear to like a small room of his disciples, but to 500 people, and then you're sort of forced to reckon either it's a great big conspiracy and a lie, which a bunch of people died for, or it actually happened. Um, so that kind of sets the stage for our discussion today. Um, we're starting on page 177, and we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about redemption so the work that jesus is doing so last week we talked about true god and true man we're going to talk about redemption today so open up your bibles to john chapter 8 verses 34 to 36 and then i will open mine up to ephesians 2 1 and we will read those so the question is why did we need to be redeemed and what does redemption mean So if somebody has John 8, 34 to 36, want to read it for us? All right, Trish, go ahead and read it for us. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Okay. And then here's Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Okay. So, in light of those two verses read, what does redemption mean? So we're, that's one of those religious words we throw around a lot, and then when somebody asks you what exactly does it mean, it always takes a moment to figure it out. What does redemption mean? Forgiveness of sins. Huh? Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins, that's part of it. Yeah? Well, the term like redeem a coupon. Yeah. Okay. Somebody did something for us so we can receive something. Okay, so that's always a good way if you're just looking for root meanings of words, is consider it in a in a bunch of different scenarios. So Pete brought up redeeming a coupon. So does that mean that you have a voucher essentially that is worth a certain amount that you use in place of something else? Right? So if Jesus is our redeemer, what if we use that language, what, what's on our voucher? Life, 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 life. 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 Or like bought back from the devil. Very good. Right. There's a there's a uh, compensatory language with redemption, right? That God, God is while all loving, he's also just. And so there's a price. Sin is a serious thing, right? It's a serious affront to God, and it requires a price to be paid. Right? Um, and so Jesus pays that price in our stead, and in return gives us a voucher, if you want to say it that way, to which now when God sees us, he sees that coupon, and that coupon says, this person has life and righteousness and salvation. Right? So that's why it's really important that when we talk about righteousness that came up in the sermon today, that we have none of our own, right? Lest we begin to start thinking that it's us doing this grand work of salvation, even in some small way, right? Uh, that's why, like, my uh, pastors traditionally wore white robes. It was to signify that the white robe was a covering of God's righteousness, right? And it was a covering over the blackness of their sin. Right? And so it was meant, ironically, even though it's usually interpreted the opposite direction now, 
It was meant, ironically, actually as a humbling of the individual in that office, right? They're a sinner, and they do this office by virtue of the righteousness of Christ, which is enshrouded. Uh, same with the white of the tab of the pollock. The only great thing that I'm bringing up over and above, I'm not some superhuman person, is the word of God. Right? So if ever I stop speaking from the authority of God's word, this is all you're getting. Right? Um, and so I ought not to do that. So it, uh, I actually have a prayer in the sacristy. It's Luther's sacristy prayer. And Luther, of course, Luther's a man with he always had a way with words, and he basically says in that in that sacristy prayer, like, I'm glad that I'm not really the one doing this, because if it was left up to me, he uses the phrase, I would have ruined everything a long time ago. <laughs> so it's a nice reminder to pray that before the service, to remind me what my role is, right? And it's a general truth for all Christians as well, right? That the righteousness that we now possess, none of it is our own. Right, it's part of that redemptive gift. Okay. Now, what about Ephesians 2 1? What does that tell us about this idea of redemption? I'll read that one more time. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Right. And what does that tell us about the way redemption works? It's completely external to us. Very good, right? The, so if you've ever heard of the phrase extra nos, that's the Latin phrase that comes outside of ourselves, right? Dead people have nothing to contribute to an active process, right? Just like the Valley of Dry Bones, which we heard read today, it's all something that God does to and for us, right? So that's actually why in the rhythm of our worship service, there are parts where we're meant to be still and be quiet and receive. Right? So sometimes you might be tempted to think, oh gosh, that was a long reading from Acts today, and Pete just milked it. Okay. <laughs> it's so slow. Couldn't even said it faster. Right? And if you have one of those thoughts in your head, you should squish it immediately. Right? Because it isn't about Pete, it isn't about you. Right? That's God's gift to you. And it's actually directly related to the topic today. One of the ways we are brought the Holy Spirit, the primary way, is through God's word. So that's why our response to that word is, thanks be to God. And if you've been going to church for any length of time, you know that occasionally it's hard to say that at the end of some of the readings. Because it doesn't seem like a gift. All right, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. You cannot follow me unless you hated your father and your mother and your brother. You know, and then at the end, you're like, thanks be to God, I guess. <laughs> but it really is, right? It's all part of this gift where God is active and we receive. And an interesting point, too, is we even try to turn that passive reception into a work that we do. Right? So that's why I wanted to make the point today that part of what the Holy Spirit does in showing us our sin is he's the one that prompts us to turn and repent. But even the repentance is not an act of our own will, but a prompting of the Spirit. Right? And the Valley of the Dry Bones is a great example. God didn't go around and say, hey, you know, do you want me to bring you back to life? He just did it. And it happened to them. Right? New decision theology. Yes. No decision theology. You don't like that stuff. All right. So redemption is a buying back. Or if you uh, if you're like me and you love that big word that nobody can really pronounce, propitiation, right? Is about that fact, right? That it's a it's a offering to pay a price, right? And then later in the, in the scriptures we hear it referred to as you are not you know no longer your own, right? Why? Because you're bought with a price. Right, and that's where, if you really want to have a fun Bible study, we could do like Luther's bondage of the will, and we could talk about how, like, you went from being a slave to sin, and now you're a slave to Christ. So you're not really free will people in the same way that our world keeps for that. Um, but I know you guys will be there for decades if you go down that hole. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments about redemption? That's question one. Okay, now open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. 
We're going to look at chapter 1, 13 and 14. And then um, a couple people look up Hebrews chapter 2, 14 to 15. I got the I have the Colossians 1 here. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then somebody have the Hebrews 2. Uh, Maggie, go ahead. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook in the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. All right. So that Hebrews 2, we're going to unpack a little bit. Uh, Colossians 1 is pretty easy, uh, but I want you to note in Colossians 1, notice the active agent of all the verbs. Who is doing the work? God is the, the language is very uh, reminiscent of bringing us up out of Egypt. Yes, yes, right? It's talking about transferring from one kingdom to a new kingdom, right? So we always compare, and the scriptures do this, which is why we compare, the great salvific events of the Old Testament in the Exodus to the great salvific events in the New Testament, crucifixion and liberation and resurrection. And, and you can make the one-to-one -one comparisons in a lot of cases, former kingdom that we're enslaved in, to promised land of, of eternal freedom in, in God, right? And that's the language that's being used here, right? And, and it doesn't say that once the redemption happens, it doesn't say uh, he has delivered them from the domain of darkness, right? Which we would say he does that via the crucifixion. It doesn't say and then we now transfer together to the kingdom of his beloved son, right? All of that action is still aligned squarely with God. That he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So, and then I like the phrase here too as well, in whom we have redemption. So we don't, we are not possessors of redemption. In other words, that if we separate ourselves from Christ, we no longer have redemption. It rests with him. So the reason that it's yours is because he rests in you. I get all that I and me and you and him language, right? So in whom we have redemption, the redemption belongs to Christ, and it's given to you by virtue of him being with you. All right, now we'll look at the Hebrews 2 passage that Maggie read for us, because that one's a little bit more meaty as far as meaning goes. And I'll read it again one more time here. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So, what is he talking about when it says that he himself likewise partook of the same things? What is that referring to? Right, so the, the enfleshing of God's word, the incarnation, right? right? He shares in the flesh and blood so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. Right, so then we're getting there to the essential nature of salvation. There had to be a death paid for the consequence of sin. So that's why he did that, okay? And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Right, and so in that act, we were delivered from our slavery to sin. Okay. Now, are we totally free from that at this point in time? No, because we still sin. No, because we still sin. Okay. But isn't Jesus' work of salvation complete? He who has done it, who has begun a good work. So, from that statement, we're not concluding as 
Yeah. Okay. So he who has begun a good work in us will bring it to completion on the day of the Lord. Right? So it's sort of a trick question because is your redemption fully accomplished right now? No, not until yes. glorification. Uh, right now, in sanctification is a constant. Well, your redemption is accomplished. Your redemption right now. is, but yes. you're not you're not complete yet. Not until glorification. You know, there's sanctification. You're still going through all that the whole time that we're here on earth. Well, so let, let's let's kind of separate that out. So if you die now, where will you go? Heaven. Heaven. Right? And we're going to get into the way that that, that parses out here today. Because a couple of people, three or four people have questions about that. Um, and that's what this covers when we talk about Jesus returning and being a judge and living the dead. But your redemption is already complete in Christ. Okay? And it's important to point that out because that's one of the things that separates our doctrine from a lot of Christian denominational teachings. Is that the sanctified life is the outgrowth of a justified life. Okay? So the scriptures, that's why they always use sort of natural growth language when they're talking about the works of those redeemed in Jesus, right? We're a tree brought back to life. We're dry bones which now have life. Right? The, the bearing of good fruit. What bears good fruit? A living and healthy tree. What makes a living and healthy tree? Jesus does. Right? We often get caught in the sort of arguments and details about like what humanity thinks of as good works. Right? Uh, the bearing of good fruit is the natural outgrowth of the Christian life. So that means that it involves repentance. It involves worship, right? Which we typically we don't think of those things as quote unquote good works, right? When we think of good works, we think about traveling to Guatemala and building houses. Okay? Now, are those good works? Sure, they are, right? But so is uh, one of the questions I asked and got a lot of uh, conversation going when I was teaching on my vicarage was, who has done a better work? The family that goes on that mission trip or the family where the parents, they don't go and yet they have devotions and read the scripture with their children at home? Either. Who has Depends done the better on each of their hearts. Huh? Depends on each of their hearts. Why do they go? We're not talking about their hearts. We're talking about the work. They're the same. Huh? They're both. They're, those works are the same. But you're doing it for God. Okay. Are you building houses for God? Well, yes and no. You're, you're building it for <laughs> the people. But you're doing it because it's what God wants. Okay. How do you know that that's what God wants? Through, through prayer. Okay. You'll, so, you'll know it. so I, I mean, you are correct. But what I'm sort of pushing out here is there are certain things that we've been given in the scriptures that we know 100% for sure are God's command because he gave them to us, right? So Luther would always say, if you have a choice between doing something that you think might be God's command versus doing something that is for sure God's command, you should prioritize the thing you know for sure, right? So we got commandment number four. So if it's the choice between doing mission tricks three times a year or reading the scripture at home with your children, you should read the scripture at home with your children. Not to the exclusion of the other thing, but if you have a choice, right? Um, and essentially what he's getting at there is that you should be letting God define what constitutes good works. Because who would you say the world is thinking is doing a better work? The missionary. The missionary, right? So, exactly. Mark, Mark said, who cares what the world thinks? In this case, that's 100% correct, right? So I don't say that to say that you shouldn't do either of those things, or you should only do one and not the other, right? If you have the opportunity to both, by all means, do it, right? But don't undervalue things that seem insignificant to the world, especially if God has explicitly commanded them. That makes them the bearing of the good truth. Yeah. Okay. We cover all of that one. Maybe here. Okay. Any any questions about that before we move on? Okay. I'm kind of trying to go a little faster today so we can get to the, the article about death and resurrection and all that stuff. Yeah. So you said you ask us if redemption is complete, and you said yes. And then the question was, then why do we still sin? Okay. Thank you for bringing us back. So 
that was a trick question, right? So in the sense of Christ's work, is Christ's work fully accomplished in, in terms of redemption? It is, right? Now, it's not fully realized until the day of the Lord, because not only did he redeem humanity, but he redeemed all of creation. Um, and so, like, we always get this image of, of us leaving here and going there. Um, and in Revelation, it's actually God bringing that to us, right? Um, and the redemption and renewal of all things. Okay. Um, so, there, now we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the death discussion, because it relates also to what happens to our bodies and why and when. Okay. Um, so, in the sense that it is incomplete, it is incomplete in that our uh, physical redemption, our created redemption, is not yet fully realized. Right? So, and that's why Paul doesn't say that you are incomplete in your redemption. He says, what still clings to you? The old Adam. The old Adam, the old sinful flesh. Right? And so that has its place still for a couple of reasons. Because I think I preached about this a couple weeks ago. Right? Why are we still here if this is all done? Right? In baptism, I'm a fully redeemed child of God. What's 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 the way? Right? So we have a seat. We just haven't occupied it yet. Yes. Right. That's a good way to say it. We have, we have a seat. We just haven't occupied it yet. And the reason that we haven't occupied it yet is it's not yet the fullness of time. We want to use the language of prophecy. Because what does God intend for us to do? Get more people to fill the seat. Yeah. Right. And or or you can maybe even say get more people to realize that they have seats. Right. Um, and the way that that's done is not by hey yo you who's struggling in your sin. I'm a perfect person, fully redeemed by Jesus, and you should be like me. That doesn't work, right? Because what happens when like what happens when you're struggling in sin? And you know it's a sin, and somebody points it out to you. What's your first reaction? Who are you to judge me? Ah, who are you to judge me? Which is a classic line of defensiveness, right? And that actually inhibits your ability to speak to that person, and it inhibits their ability to hear you. Rather, we've been given the approach as ones redeemed, right? Who are once dead and are now alive, we can say, "I'm just like you." Let me talk about the person who brought me to life because he intends to do that for you too. Yeah. Um, which is consequently just sort of a reflection of the nature of the incarnation in general. Right? Jesus took on flesh, like one of us, under the law so that we could be redeemed. But it, the scriptures also tell us that's a comfort to us because he knows weakness just like we do. He can relate. We don't have a savior who can't relate. And so as witnesses, we relate to those we witness to because we are like them apart from Christ. And so then we give them what God gave us. We give them Christ, which we receive from the Holy Spirit. Okay. How did all this work? So let's look at Romans 3.25. I was going to divide these up into short verses. I'll just read them so people on, who are watching online can be sure here. So Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. So how did Jesus redeem me from my sins? <coughs> By his death, which served as a propitiation. You got it, right? What does that mean? We talked about that a little bit. Propitiation. I'll read you the Lutheran study Bible here. Propitiation. The Ark of the Covenant's cover where the Holy is it's related to the Hilasterion and the Septuagint. The Ark of the Covenant's cover where the high priest sprinkled the blood of the sacrifices. As the propitiation covered the Ark of the Covenant, Christ's righteousness covers every sinner. He is the sacrifice for sin. So he's the blood offering. That's what propitiation is. The blood offering. And 
That's significant because how does the scriptures describe blood? What is blood always the symbol of in the scriptures? Life. And so the, the death is being paid for. Jesus is the blood sacrifice. He's giving up his life, his blood, in order to buy us back. Which should be of note, the Old Testament rituals using blood to wash away sins was wash away the criminal death that sin caused. Correct. And it's such a favorable word. Like I, I, I think of you know making up for somebody's sin as being almost like you're in the negative and you're bringing it back to maybe neutral. But propitiation is such a positive word. It means to make something favorable. Yeah. So, so, you're, so Jesus is making us favorable to God. Right. It's, 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 it's much more active than just simply taking away the negative. It's, it's adding Correct. favor. Right, that's a great point. Because it's because if you, if you would say that his death is just making us sort of like neutral or palatable to God, then you naturally then think that you must then do something further. Right? But it, it's further than that. It's a it's a making right completely of that relationship, of that, of that, uh, that brokenness has been fully restored to the original favor of God and the relationship that He desires with us. Um, yeah. So in, in that case, that, that's probably not a very um, religious word then. Oh, it's a highly religious word. It's not an especially Christian, Christian. word or a Hebrew word. Right. I mean, people are making all kinds of gods. Right. Happy right. in the ancient Near East and other places. Really for appeasing. It, 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 it is, it yes. is it, okay. there, there is an appeasement, but there's that pro part that is, it's a it's a favor part. It's not just making up for the bad. It's it's also good. Well, and we also, so it's not that we necessarily use totally different language. But we, we, there is an appeasing that happens here. Right? But the appeasing is not done by us, which is, that's the distinction, right? And, in a, in a pagan religion, the appeasing is always done by the devotee. Right? Uh, it is uh, essentially, if you were to summarize it, most religions, and this is where I always kind of go when I have somebody who, who tells me that all religions are essentially the same. I say, well, actually, my religion is like the opposite of most religions. Because in most religions, the direction of redemption is the, the devotee ascending to God or some level of, at which they then become worthy. Right? And the primary act in the Christian faith is actually one of descension, where God comes down to do the appeasing in our stead. Um, and so it actually moves in the opposite direction, um, which is kind of a useful one of you when I say that people are sort of like, I've never thought about that before. And that was the same thing I said when somebody told me that the first time. Um, and it really it was, I, for me, it was very helpful in that context of pluralism, um, where everybody's like, well, it's all sort of the same. But actually, it's not. Um, and not even, not even the same, but also like actually the opposite. Which is, of course, for me, being a philosopher, one of the reasons why I think the plan had to be God's, because all the human plans that we would compare it to would never come up with that solution, because it doesn't make sense to us. Why would God do that? All right, and then the first Peter two verse twenty four. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Right, so this isn't the example, I always thought of this in the courtroom terms, with a guilty or innocent verdict. This isn't some influential person coming in and getting you pardoned. This is somebody literally taking your place. So the, the punishment is not off the table. The punishment's still on the table. It's just born on somebody else. Right? Um, and a good reminder of that is if you watch The Passion of Christ. Right? That, that whole part of leading up to the passion, the suffering Jesus endured at the hands of sinful men. Right? That was the penalty for us being taken by somebody else. It's important to realize that because it, that again speaks to the, ne the necessity of God of Jesus being true true man. That a man needed to suffer these penalties for the wrongs that creatures of the human creature made against God. 
And so it was born by a human creature, Jesus. Right? Do you have the Isaiah phrase there? By his wounds, by his stripes, we are healed. Okay. Any other questions about redemption, how it works? All right, we're on to part three. So Luke 24, everybody turn to Luke chapter 24. We're going to read through a few verses here. We're starting at verse 36. So this is the uh, resurrection chapter in Luke, where so Jesus has died and risen, and now he's appearing to his disciples. But now what we're going to talk about is we've confessed our faith in that Jesus has done the work of redemption, right? He's died on the cross. He has descended into hell. He now ascends. He was resurrected from the dead and ascends apart. Now we're talking about what, what did that do? What does that all mean that, he, that this has now been accomplished? As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do you doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. All right, so what's the first thing Jesus says to his disciples? Peace to you. Is that intentional? Yes. Does it have one meaning or multiple here? I would say multiple. Multiple, okay. What, what, what are the multiple meanings? It's a greeting. Okay, well, yeah, but that's sort of reading back into it. This is where that greeting comes from, or an expression of that greeting, right? Shalom, peace to you, right? Um, but why is Jesus saying that here specifically? Yeah. Um, I think for, for two reasons. One, because who they all had hope in, they thought was dead, and they knew the leaders wanted them dead, so oh. they were fear up and hold in this upper room. Right. And second of all, here comes a guy that just kind of went through the walls. Um, and he's probably like, hey, so I would put those in the same, those are the same thing, right? It's addressing their immediate worldly fear. Yeah, but there were fear about two completely different things. That's what I'm saying. Fear from being caught by the high priest and whatnot, and fear of seeing what they thought was a ghost. Sure. So Jesus is bringing peace to you, is not addressing their fear of the, the leaders, right? Because He's addressing his presence has caused a fear, right? The reason that the fear that from the, the, the chief priests and the leaders, right, is the reason that they're all locked in a room, right? So he says, peace to you, because he shows up out of nowhere, this guy they thought was dead, right? So there's that immediate, like, the same with the angels, right? Do not be afraid, even though I look freaky and I just showed up out of nowhere, right? So that's part of it. What's the second part? Thank you, preacher. And it's uh, recent weeks, eternal peace. And in fact, I think yes. given eternal peace. Right. So here we understand this is what, what has occurred here, right? Salvation is complete. He's rose victorious over death. So he can say peace to them, not only to their immediate earthly fears, but to their the ultimate fear of, of being separated from God is no more. Right. So we understand that in both those senses there. And I would say that the, the the leaders of the people that they're afraid of are kind of wrapped up into the first peace be to you right? in this immediate earthly sense. And they heard what their women had said. They wanted, I, I'm sure they wanted to believe it, but it was against their better judgment to actually believe them at that point. Right. And so, um, but while they still did not believe her joy and marvel, like that's, that's a really it is. cool kind of thing. Like they, they wanted to believe, but there was something in their logical brain standing in their way, and then, you know, he shatters that. Right, he right. shatters whatever was standing in the way. Right. 
Yeah, because you can see that he is actually, he does multiple things in order to assure his disciples that he is alive and he is who he says he is, right? So they, that, that verse is even in there after he's, he's uh, explained to them, like, see my hands, I really be. Right. And they're still not quite there. Right. And then and then he's like, all right, give me a fish and I'll eat it. So you know, spirit doesn't need to eat a piece of fish, right? Um, he's remarkably patient with the humans who are like, what? What's going on? I, I see that you're there, but I, I don't really believe it, right? Um, all right, then in verse 44, he goes on. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. All right, so that one passage there, verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Still all about the word. Very good. Right? Still all about the word because Jesus is the fulfillment of the word. Right? And so what we're meant to understand as Christians is all of the scriptures are understood through Jesus, through the person of Jesus. Right? So that's how when we read in Isaiah, we're reading about really specific prophecies. That Jesus fulfills, we believe them 100%. We don't believe that some dude went back after the fact and wrote that stuff in. Right? Why? Because Jesus is the fulfillment. He was always meant to be the fulfillment. And so when he comes along, it changes the meaning of the whole body of word. Right? And the best example of seeing this is, is the, the life of Saul becoming Paul. Nobody convinced Paul that the Old Testament was about Jesus apart from God himself. Right? And the way that he convinced him is he revealed himself as Lord. I'm the guy. And then after that, Paul has to reevaluate everything. He has to reevaluate his understanding of the law. He has to reevaluate his understanding of the covenant. Right? And all of that comes after knowing Jesus is Lord. Right? And right here, we're witnessing that with the disciples. Because they clearly didn't fully get what was going on. Right? They're hiding in a room even though they should know that the God of the universe is on their side. And here is where that really comes to roost. Because they were probably along with everybody else. They're like, oh, he said he's going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. And they probably were actually thinking about the temple and not his body, right? And sometimes he even explains that, and they're probably still thinking, eh, run into them. Yeah, even though Christ came, they saw all this what he said they still had to wait for the holy spirit to come yes give them the power to do it right yes so i think actually the holy spirit had a twofold purpose for the apostles one was for them so that they had the ability to proclaim the gospel as as god needed them to establish his church in all nations but it was also primarily for the perpetuation of god's word from generation to generation to generation because how, how did all of us in this room receive faith in Christ? Via the working of the Holy Spirit through Christians from previous generations, right? Um, and if God's goal is to save as many people as possible, he has to have a plan that accounts for the generations subsequent until the great and magnificent day of the Lord. All right, and then we get the ascension here. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands. He blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple of blessing of God. So how did Jesus' resurrection change things? Let's get a little list here. Kind of relieved you from the fear of death. Right. That peace to you stuff. Right. Relieved from the fear of death and ultimate condemnation. Right. So, and Paul belabors this point quite a bit, that the law is no longer condemning, right? It still shows us our sin, it's still in play, but we're free from its condemnation. No? We were able to understand his kingdom. 
They were able to understand his kingdom because what did he do for them? He opened up the scriptures, right? So we now fully understand God's word and his plan of salvation even from the very beginning. Right? So prior to Jesus, nobody knew that Genesis 3.15 was actually about Jesus. But now we know, because he's told us. Right? And it's sort of like a sort of humorous stance that I've, I've uh, for Lutherans, like this is what we would say about our stance on communion, but really in general, it's like if the resurrected guy said so, it's probably true. Right? Um, because what does the resurrection signify? That Jesus is everything he said he was. Right? So that means that what he says is what the Son of God says, which is what was now sort of fully understood by his disciples. Yeah. Uh, he also took all the Old Testament traditions and rituals and made them useless at that point. Yeah, well, not useless, fulfilled, completed. Fulfilled, yeah. Yeah. Well, in a sense, the rituals are kind of useless because you're not going to give blood sacrifices. Oh, okay. So if you're talking about specifically like yeah. sin sacrifice offerings, yeah. yeah. So that that is, I wouldn't. I would say useless is a, is the wrong word. No longer necessary. Right? Completed. Uh, the the book on that is shut. Right? Um, I was thinking you'd mean also like the laws and the promises and stuff. Um, okay. Uh, plus verse forty-five opened their mind so they could understand the scriptures. Yes. So. The understanding of the scriptures, so I, I made reference to Genesis 3.15. We now know Genesis 3.15 is about Christ. Um, all the promises of the Messiah are fulfilled. And then, of course, this is, nobody said this because it's probably super obvious, is that now we are inheritors of the kingdom of God. Because if what, what is one of the ways that Jesus is described as being a resurrected human? He is the first fruits of this new thing, this resurrected life, which means he's not the only fruits. Who are the other fruits? We're fruits. Us, right? Because he's joined his life to ours. Okay, now we're going to get to the fun part. How does the resurrection from the dead work? How does our resurrection from the dead work? All right, so I'm going to divide up these titles. Uh, so uh, let's see. Pete, can you do Isaiah 26, verse 19? Uh, Mark, can you do Daniel 12, verse 2? Are you guys going on here? Yeah. All right, so can you guys do the Luke 23, 39 to 43? Uh, let's see. Dave, uh, can you do John 5, verse 28? Um, Karen, you got a Bible? Uh, can you do the First Thessalonians four sixteen and uh, Janet Revelation twenty verse four? Do you want to do John six forty? Did I skip one? You did. Oh, uh, Cheryl, you want to do John six verse forty? All right. So the question as we're the question I want you to be pondering as we read these verses is how does our resurrection from the dead work? And this is what a couple of people had questions about when we're getting started here. Okay. All right. Pete, Isaiah. Sorry. You see me. Oh. Um, you can go back to you. Uh, you got it? Yeah, here we go. Uh, your dead shall live, your bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light. Okay, so what does that tell us about our resurrection? What's one thing we get from that? What kind of resurrection will it be? Physical. Physical, right? That you who are dwelling in dust, buried in the earth, the earth will give birth to the dead, right? So that's a bodily resurrection, right? Uh, Daniel 12, 2, Mark. Another spring thing. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some shame and everlasting death. Okay, so what does that tell us about the resurrection? It's for everybody. It's for everybody, not just believers, but also unbelievers. But the result after the resurrection is very different. All right, uh, Luke 23. 
Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. All right, so that's the thief on the cross. What do we learn about that? What do we learn about the resurrection from that one? It's kind of fast. It's kind of fast, right? What does Jesus say? He doesn't say someday. He says today you'll be with me in paradise, right? So it's immediate. All right, what about John 5, 28? Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tomb will hear his voice. All right, an hour is coming. Huh. Is that maybe okay? So we've still got the benefit of the doubt here because the hour could still be today, although it's been a while since that was written. So there's there's an appointed time as well as saying it's an immediate thing. All right. What about uh, John six forty? For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Oh, okay. So now we're doing a raising on the last day. Is the last day today? I mean, it could be, I suppose. Um, but so far, it hasn't been, right? Um, so, there's make stages. a note of that. There's, seems like there's stages to this. Seems like there's stages. Very good. All right, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Pay close attention to yourselves and to your teachings. Continue in these things. For in doing this, will you save both yourself and the hearers? All right. Witness. Is that First Thessalonians chapter four, chapter sixteen? We'll we'll come back to you here. Uh, Revelation twenty four, June. twenty twenty verse four. Sorry. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay. In Revelation 20 verse 4, what does that tell us? Sorry. What does that tell us about the resurrection? So John's having a vision. Well, yes, it's going to be crazy. Um, it's going to be, I can pretty much guarantee, unlike anything you've ever seen. In fact, um, what does John notice? There's, There are redeemed people present. What does he say about them? They have the authority to judge. Uh-huh. They got the well, did they? Look at the words. What does it say? What does he see? Huh? Just their souls, right? It specifically says that their souls were present in the in the presence of the throne. Right? And then what happens later? Do what? Ah, all right. So we're starting to get some light shed on these stages here. All right, we got, uh, we got our first Thessalonians now? Yeah. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, and with an archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will be sent from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. All right. So another great and magnificent day of the Lord reference there. All right. So how does this work? If there's an immediate resurrection in the presence of the kingdom of God, and yet there's that on the last day part. So what's going on here? Do they think they figured it out? Maybe they already did. On the last day, your body will go to your spirit. Okay. So the immediate effect of the resurrection is when he's speaking to the people on the cross, is you today you'll be with me in paradise. We understand from the other elements of the scriptures about the resurrection is referring to the soul, right? So in John's vision and revelation, 
It's the souls of those who have died giving testimony about Christ that are present already. And then later, the bodily resurrection. Right? And that actually is pretty consistent with the understanding of the day of the Lord, because what is happening on the day of the Lord? It is the redemption of all creation. And that includes your body. Right? And then we, we're told that what's going to happen to our body? Perfectly restored, just as is? Oh, even better. We're all going to have six packs? All right. So it's, but then it's more than a restoration. It's a brand new thing. Um, and so we don't know exactly what that means, right? Um, but it means that we're going to have a heavenly body, and it says a heavenly body just like Christ, right? Because did, did Jesus give up his 100% his humanity after ascending to heaven? No, right? So if you see, if you see pictures of people have drawn of Jesus after his ascension, what do they still always show? They show the wounds from the cross, right? They actually usually depict like the holes in his hands with jewels, right? Um, but re signifying that like this is the price that was paid, but the work has been completed. Um, so the mystery there, as far as timing goes, we understand from the scripture to be the difference between the like it's not like your soul's just sort of hibernating underground with what's left of your body until the last day. Right? It is. But the soul is immediately in the presence of God in his kingdom. And then fully restored as you were intended, right? Humans were always intended to be body and soul. Right? So, uh, and fully restored on the, the final day of the resurrection of all things. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Um, Keith has two questions. <laughs> the first one is it says the body is going to rise up on the earth. Yeah. yeah. Reminded of the, the scripture we read today of the Valley of the Bones. Yeah. I'm assuming with God's power, being cremated wouldn't be a problem because the ashes are going to be part of the earth anyway. Am I correct in that assumption? Pretty much, that's what we would say. Like, if somebody was buried 2,500 years ago, they're gone. Right, right. Um, Physically speaking. Well, they're not really gone, of course. Well, Laws and entropy and all that nonsense. Like that. <laughs> um, the other question is if our bodies are to be restored, and I know it wasn't the last day when Jesus was resurrected, why does his body still have the wounds? Why does it still have the wounds? Or is that something that you cannot use? I don't think I can answer for sure, but the understanding, I mean, like, well, actually, no, I can't. So in Revelation, it always, even in even in the context of Revelation, the lamb who was slain is always depicted as still being wounded, which, or at least visibly so. Um, so the understanding of the punishment of sins that still is an eternal thing, right? And so that's typically the understanding there, that the price that was paid, that's, it's there. Um, now, whether or not that still causes suffering, I don't, I, you know, we don't really know. My guess would be not, but um, but it's meant to be like that's the eternal sacrifice once for all. Right? So it's not a temporary alleviation of the problem of sin. Right? And who knows? Maybe once everything is recreated, maybe I don't know. But I don't think the scriptures talk about that. But I haven't really looked for that specifically. But I can look at that. And see I have another answer. Yeah. How about? So that Thomas could believe. Oh yeah, well, I, I mean, there seemed to yeah. be there seemed to be a proof point that was necessary. Sure, so. sure. Um, I think you are asking more about post ascension, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that could be why we would depict that in art, especially as well, is to signify like the reality of it, and maybe it's also an affirmation of his fully becoming a creature. As well, yeah, and, and also, like his flesh wasn't just sort of a facsimile, yeah. the real thing. And also, other resurrections are being brought to Lazarus. I'm sure Lazarus is still in the same type of body he was before he came. I'm sure he wasn't just perfectly new. Yeah, 
historic body. Oh well, yeah, because it wasn't the last day. Right, and our our understanding is that Lazarus is, is now dead, awaiting the, the, the final day. Um, so yeah, so the all the miracles of Jesus in his earthly ministry were reflections of the ultimate freedom from from sin, including his resurrection of, of the people that he raised from the dead. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I don't know whether scripturally there's an answer for this, but I mean, I imagine like somebody coming to, coming to Christianity, that would be a, maybe a pressing question is sure. like, is there a is there a consciousness to the soul before it's re it's brought together with the body again? I mean, because Christ says to the the, the uh, thief on the cross, you'll, you'll be with me today. You're saying that's the soul, obviously. Yeah. That is our we don't know that it's a consciousness of that soul and have it before. Um, I mean, our, under, our understanding of the way it's written is that it would, and that you're not just sort of in stasis. But because I think it describes them as as being active in the revelation imagery there in chapter 20. And then they're also like primarily active in their work of worship and praise to God. Right? So there is, um, I think it's a like. You're conscious, but it's not the work is not yet totally finished until you are whole again as a human. And humanity is always described as body and soul together. Um, and I think that's also part of what it means that Christ is the first fruits of those who fall asleep. Right? His resurrection, which is a bodily one, is the form of the resurrection that we will have as well. Good question though. Yeah. The revelations that we were reading, um, it seems as though some people have already been resurrected and they're with Jesus now. Well, okay, so our understanding of there are only a few people that have been bodily brought to heaven and they did not go the normal means, they were brought prior to death. Um, beyond that, we don't really know exactly how that works, other than that they were they bypassed the death to life formula that we follow. Yeah. I mean, um, specifically the people that were beheaded and therefore witnessed Jesus. Sure. Yeah. So that gets a little bit into what we we call what's called uh, theologically dispensations, and dispensationalisms. Uh, so that depends on how you understand the millennia that's being referred to there. Uh, Lutherans are amillennialists, which we believe not a literal millennium. So we don't believe that there's a going to be a thousand years where those people will be brought back to life before the day of the Lord. Some Christian traditions do. Um, and I'd be happy to answer more questions about that, but that's a big topic. I mean, that would be like another 10-week Bible study probably. Um, <laughs> Because there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack. Yeah, no. Like, so our understanding uh, is we'll that our and understanding and is that their bodily resurrection will be the, the day of the Lord, not a time prior to that. Um, but the understanding that we have from Revelation as well is that their souls are like they're not just sort of floating there unconscious. Because if you, if you read five, it says then the rest of the dead did not come. Like, what does that refer to? Like, they're dead and they're, you know, their souls, everything is just black, or? Well, let's look here. Yeah. Oh, you're, so the first resurrection thing is what you're talking about. So, Refers to regeneration, the divine work by which sinners are raised from spiritual death to spiritual life by the means of grace. This is received through faith in this life and then consummated in paradise. As such, it is, is to be distinguished from the bodily resurrection that occurred at Christ's second coming. So we understand that as referring to, like, you are a new creation right now through the spiritual regeneration of your soul by means of the Holy Spirit and the work of Christ. So that's what it's talking about in that, that we understand the first resurrection is like right now essentially right the church witnessing to the world because we have been brought to life um in that spiritual but like everyone else 
we won't have to bother resurrection until the day four. Sorry, I didn't really understand what you're asking. Any other questions about that? We can do a Bible study on dispensations. Yeah. So I understand that this is a more personal, really. When you die, your soul will go to heaven. That, that's is what that, we understand yes. the scripture okay. is saying. Yep. And your soul is in heaven, but it is you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have someone who has died, but his soul is in heaven. Yes, that's our understanding. Um, and if I die, my soul goes to heaven. Hopefully. Yes. Um, so will I know his soul? As, as far as those sorts of questions go, that's a that's a big can of worms because like a lot of people only have life in this world as a frame of reference and the life in the world to come. But we know that like marriage is not gonna be the same here, if at all. Right. And so does that mean that like my entire eternity I'm gonna be thinking of this person as my husband or my wife? It doesn't seem so. Now, when I say that, I want you to hear that whatever relationship you do have is going to be far better than any earthly derivation that we can think of. We just don't know exactly the nature of it. So when we say somebody is looking down on us from heaven, they're not. They're not. I mean, if you were face to face with Jesus, would you be looking anywhere else? No, but, you know, being here, you sure. want the cup. Thinking. What what done. comfort of what what comfort would that actually bring you? Well, that I'm still connected. You are still connected, but not. Um, I mean, think about it this way: it would actually be a weird form of torture for a soul in heaven to be observing Earth, right? Especially if they love you, right? Because you're living in a place of of deception and death and and despair, right? So. Our understanding of that is that probably for their sake, that, that they're fully with God in this new place, right? And your connection to them is that you will also be there when your time comes, right? And so, like when I'm doing a funeral, I don't, that's why I intentionally don't, in my sermons, talk about the emotional side of, like, peace. Because it isn't really there once you dig into it. Like what brings you peace is the reality that you believe in faith that they are freed from the pain and suffering of sin and death and they are with God. Right? One way I heard it expressed, which was pretty powerful, was uh, on my vicarage, there was a guy at the church there who lost both of his teenage daughters in a car accident. Right? Awful, terrible thing. And obviously, in, in a lot of suffering over that. And he told the pastor, and then the pastor, my supervisor, told me this. That the thought that kept him going and gave him any sort of semblance of peace, especially initially, was that they were with the only person who could love them much better than he could. Right. And so essentially, like our emotionalism about death is inherently corrupted by our selfish nature. And it's usually about us. Right. Um, and so it's the same with like when people say that somebody turns into an angel and they're watching over. They don't turn into an angel. They're, they're not watching over you. Angels are watching over you, but it's not your grandma or your grandpa. Or your okay. um, is that an issue? Yeah, sort of. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean there, there is an aspect of like how you're going to relate to your husband when you get to heaven. Yeah. Like, it won't be the same, but I don't know exactly what it'll be. It'll be better. Yeah. 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 Ye
especially because of the work of Jesus, is not like a total trash heap, right? So that's why when we talk about the new heavens and the new earth, it's a redemption of creation. It's not like a scrapping of creation and a starting over. Right? Um, it's a new covenant in Jesus, right? So he wouldn't have gone through all the work to become a human and die to redeem humans if he was just going to scrap the project and start over, right? So that's not our understanding of, of resurrection, of new life. But I can't answer really what will be retained whenever that redemption is fully realized, uh, apart from that it's going to be better than anything we can. I mean, it's sort of essentially what people ask me, like, am I really going to be like in a choir for eternity and just sing that song? Right? Uh, because in their mind, they're thinking that doesn't sound like paradise. But our, our understanding of, of things is that like it's better, it's transcendent, it's better than anything you can imagine. So you won't be disappointed in heaven. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. Okay. So somebody dug some leaves and she just If you need to go, I'm so sorry. No, 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 no problem. They don't. Are they still their soul? Is just content. Um, so if they don't believe, you're asking for someone who dies and is not a believer. Well, I'm saying there's still some people here I know that just can't, they believed, and now they just don't believe. Um, so, so if they die today, they don't believe. So, and, and so that's one of the things that we, we don't believe in once saved, always saved. So, um, this gets into some our understanding of the way scripture talks about election is that uh, it is not in the Calvinistic sense that you're guaranteed either way. Um, it's always spoken for us as a doctrine of comfort for those that faith. So if you're in doubt about your faith, you can talk about the way scriptures speak in for sure language for those who believe. But it's also clear that if they reject the Holy Spirit, which is the rejection of God's work of salvation. Right, the, the Holy Spirit is trying desperately to give me the Jesus stuff, and you just say, no, 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 I don't need that, I don't want that, or I have my own plan. Then, um, what was one of, the, one of the verses we read? They will be raised along with us on the last day, but their resurrection will be to a different end. Right? Um, and that's a hard thing, and I think it's meant to be a hard thing, right? That's one of the functions of the law. It's like, if this is the case, and we know that there is a time when it's no, you're no longer able to come to faith and be redeemed. Right? And we understand that it's the day of judgment. Once the day of judgment is here, the time of mercy, the time of uh, giving you an opportunity to, to come to faith is over. And then the judgment is made. And what that's meant to do for the church here on earth and for us in our familial relationships, us in our friendship relationships, co-worker relationships, is give us a sense of urgency about sharing our faith, right? If you look at the language of Paul in the New Testament, he's always talking about Jesus as if he's showing up tomorrow, right? And he would have, I think, if he was living for another 200 years, he would have done the same thing every day, right? Because maybe I'm going to be alive until that last day. Maybe I'm going to die next week, right? It's possible. Get in the car on my way home today, right? And so the, the point of that is not to be morose or despairing, but to understand that we're a people for a different world, right? Our life here is temporary and we must understand it in that sense. And temporary means fleeting. So we better be about our business while we have the opportunity to be about it, right? Not just for our sake, but for, for those in our life who we want to be with. Now there's a balance there too, because like Jesus, when he sends his disciples out, he says, if you share my message with a town and they reject you and drive you out and shake the dust off your feet and move on for I came for all people, right? Um, so there is a point there where at least publicly you're no longer, so some of you may be in that point with some of your relationships where it's like, well, it's really hard to talk to so-and-so about anything related to the church because as soon as I do, they just close off, right? At that point, Prayer and trusting in the Holy Spirit 
is where you gotta go. And who knows, he may open that up again for you. Right. But we're meant to be ever seeking that and ever ready for it. That's that's what you know Peter says, right? Be, be always prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in you. Somebody else said, yeah. Um, I just have a question. If are people who uh, are souls are with Christ, do they see each other? You know, for example, like if you had a child that died sure. and you know was with Jesus and then you died and you're with Jesus, would you see your child? So when we, we talk about that, we say yes, right? So like scripture doesn't like go into a lot of detail about the nature of the relationship between the souls in heaven, probably because we can assume that it's pretty similar to the relationships that we understand to a certain degree. Like obviously it's the perfected form of that. Um, but there's no reason for us to to not assume that they're all in a joint activity and they're being described and they're all worshiping God. Now, is it you know, like the reunion that we might picture, where they see me coming from a long way off and they run out, they're like, Oh, I've been waiting for you for 72 years. You know, <laughs> probably not, right? Because the person who's running to you is not your loved ones, it's Jesus, the Father, right? Um, but you know, I don't know if he'll, he'll, he'll usher you in and say, Hey, you've got some people who've been waiting for you. Yeah. Um, but that's where the, the comfort in the picture of heaven. And I think it's really important not to get lost too much in the details here, because we have no frame of reference. I mean, it's like there were two imperfect beings trying to describe perfection to each other. Neither one of us knows what that's like. Right? But the image of heaven is always presented in a, it will be better than you could possibly imagine since. And that's what we're meant to hold on to. So while it's fun to speculate, the same with angels, right? It's fun to speculate, but don't get lost in the details of speculation. And forget about the things that we do know for sure, which is it's going to be unbelievable and better than we can. Any other? I don't mind taking a little longer here. If you need to go, you can, but I know there were some people that really had questions about this. So, yeah, Ron. Uh, how hard is it to determine when we uh, rise up in Christ and all that stuff? Do we have a glorified body? Yeah. Uh, what does that exactly mean? I've heard that, well, everything will be fine with you. You're nothing will pain you any longer. So we don't we can't say a lot of specifics about what a glorified heavenly body will be like, but we can say that about it, right? Because like aging, death, ailments, those are all manifestations of the fallen creation, of corrupted creation by sin. Right? So nobody's gonna get nobody's gonna get cancer or having joint aches or because your body will be perfect. So and um, so it's not going to be in a state of degradation in any, in any sense of that. So we could go as far to say that exactly what it's going to look like and how it's going to work. You know, once again, we don't want to get too lost in the weeds on those sorts of things. But yeah. <laughs> I can't speak to the hair thing, but uh, um, I don't see why it's yours with it. <laughs> I know I can't see why you wouldn't get it back, but I also can't say that. So. All right, any other questions related to how our resurrection works? So uh, just so I'll close with this piece of advice. When you're when you're talking to somebody who's dealing with a death of, of somebody very close to them, there are two main things you should do. One is you should ask them about that person. Because one of the one of the things you're going to do is they want to talk about the person, and that's good, because right? they're not meant to be forgotten. Okay, but that is separate from the peace that you're going to provide them, right? because it isn't you that's providing the peace. All right, and I I have an experience. In, you know, I'm I'm present when sometimes people are taking off machines and things like that, okay? and in those moments, the natural human reaction is. What do I say? What do I do? What do I say? What do I do? I want to make this go away. Because you, you can almost just feel it. Um, and that's as a, as a secondary person there. Okay? For the primary people that are feeling it, much worse. Okay? 
And I was thinking that I was in my head about that on my vicarage when I was in a situation like that. And while I was thinking about that, my vicarage supervisor just started reading the scriptures, words of Jesus about the resurrection. Okay. So it's important that as Christians, in the face of death, we don't speak for ourselves, but we bring Jesus' words to bear in that situation. That's what I do at a funeral, right? Because Jesus is the only person who speaks hope in the face of death. I don't, you don't, he does. So you don't have to come up with some nice sounding poem, or you don't have to come up with the perfectly formed phrase. Go with something that Jesus said, and you'll be good to go. Okay. All right. On that note, we will close with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise and honor and glory that you loved us so much that you became one of us in Jesus that you stood in our place and took the price for our sin the punishment that we deserved and now because of that in your victory over death in your grace and love you gave us that victory in you as well Help us understand that even when we're feeling down about our lives, that you have clothed, the, clothed us in your perfect robe of righteousness, and that we are indeed co-inheritors of the kingdom of God. Be with all of those here who are struggling with grief and loss. Assure them with a certain hope and the promise of the resurrection, that the souls of their loved ones are with you right now, free from pain and suffering, face to face with their Lord they will be reunited again in their earthly death and then all of us together on the final day, the great and magnificent day where creation will be fully restored and made new in your kingdom. Until then, sustain us through the gifts of grace in your word and sacraments. Give us a zeal to talk to those in our lives who do not know you or have fallen away. And if they don't want to speak to us, then help us speak to you about it and raise their cause before your throne in the confidence that you hear our prayers. Be with us this week as we do all that you have placed before us. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.